Well, folks, we're glad to be back with you today. And next time we'll pick up in Philippians, unless the Lord directs me to go a different way. We've got one message left in Philippians. But today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. In fact, one of the favorite books for so many people in the Bible. I remember when I was in the military, I was in basic training, and I'd had ROTC in college and ROTC in high school. And so they made me what they call a platoon guide in basic training. And what that is, I was an acting sergeant. And I was a platoon sergeant, and I had a, an assistant, and I had four squad leaders, and, and we really did have a lot of authority. Uh, and it was a great time. I, I enjoyed basic training, unlike some folks. I thought it was easier than football practice, and, uh, and I had not been long. It had not been long since I had trusted Christ, and I didn't know much. I just knew that Jesus loved me. That's what I knew. So I uh, talked to the chaplain. He gave me a whole bunch of Bibles, and then I had 52 guys in my platoon. And I said, guys, would y'all like to do a Bible study? Now, can you imagine at night before we went to bed, had to be in bed by 9 o'clock because we got up early, needless to say. And, uh, and they did. It was amazing. Basic training companies are great places to minister because the people are broken. Didn't know much, didn't, but I did know God loved me. And so this is where I started. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I remember a young man named Rubio. Don't remember his last name. But uh, he was from New York City. And Rubio, after that first night, he said, are there other things like that in the Bible? He'd never heard that before. I said, yeah, Rubio, there, there are a lot of things like that in the Bible. So without any background, he believed that Jesus loved him. Now, isn't that a pretty cool thing? Robinson just got back from Lahore in Pakistan and other cities around Lahore, little communities, villages, really. And he was sharing with them the, the complete, unadulterated, unfiltered, everlasting, total, like any, there any other word you want to come up with, love of God expressed through His Son and through the Holy Spirit and through Himself, God the Father, and how well they received it. And he had crowds upwards of a thousand people. That's pretty exciting in Haiti. That's a real big, I mean Haiti, in uh that's a big crowd there too, but that's a real big crowd in Pakistan. So uh, how exciting. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to share a little bit. I'm going to read and then we're going to hone in on two verses in particular in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. And, and what we, today we want to begin to see myself, see yourself like He sees me. I want to see me like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit sees me. And I want you to see yourself the same way. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, I'm going to read it to you. For you know the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you through His poverty might become rich. Now, we have a, an exchange right here. And it's because of what He did on the cross. And it's even before that, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit covenant, covenanted together before anything was created to create man and bring him into fellowship with themselves. Now, I don't understand why He would do that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But they did. And they brought us into themselves. Some people call this a circle dance. They brought us into themselves. And then God the Father sent God the Son. And He was born of a virgin, became a man, emptied Himself of His power. Now, I don't understand how He could do that being fully God, but He did. And He still had, He operated out of the power of the Holy Spirit, just like you do. And then something took place that was amazing. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It's called the exchange life. And it's a glorious exchange life. In verse 12, I'm going to read verse 12 before we go back and look at the whole chapter. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. 
Now I'm going to tell you how I used to look at this. And this is really tragic. I used to look at this as one day, yeah, one day you're going to see yourself like you really are. One day you're going to see all the wicked things that you've done. You're going to see all the bad thoughts. You're going to see everything and you're going to know yourself like God knows you. Do you see how I looked at that? And tragically, that's the same way a lot of other people look at things. They think God is a judgmental God that's just waiting to get you. Rather than the fact that God is a loving God, is the loving God, who chose you before time existed. It's just another picture, and it's totally wrong. Well, I wrote down some things before I actually start looking at the Scriptures, but some things that I will know. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but I just want to read them to you. Here's some things that I will know when I know how I'm known. Some things that I will know when I know how He knows me. Well, first of all, how am I known? Well, I am known to be uh, I am known to be lovely to behold. I am wonderfully made for His glory. I am bought with a price. I am a pearl of great price. I am the pearl of great price. Some people think that Jesus is the pearl of great price. And when we find Him, we go and we sell everything. No. That's what He did. We are the pearl of great price. And He forsook everything and purchased us. What a deal. I was bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ before the foundation of the universe. Before anything was created in God, it was completed, me being brought into Himself. I am a child loved by His Father. Do you have children? You love them. Do you have grandchildren? No, you love me even more. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, it's funny. My grand my grandson was over here this weekend, and he's 14 years old, and he's really he's really smart, good athlete, good looking kid. Well, he's a Snyder, you know how it goes. And, but all that is true, really. I mean, he really is. But he's funny. He's real quiet, except when he's talking to his buddies. But uh, I'll walk in in the morning. He'll be eating breakfast or something, and I look at him. I go, hmm. He'll look at me, and he'll go, hmm. And he knows I'm joking. And I'll just give him a look. There's a communication that goes back and forth, back and forth. Don't even have to say anything. And it's that way with all my grandchildren. Because they know one thing. You know the thing they know beyond anything else? And this changes everything. They know that Papa's love them. Papa, Papa, me, loves them. They know that they are Papa's boy or Papa's girl. I'd say, who are you? That's easy. I'm Papa's boy. Who are you? I'm Papa's girl. They know, praise the Lord, we don't have any twins. We've got them that are 14 minutes apart uh, from different, uh, sorry, 14 hours apart from different mothers, you know, but, but uh, I say to them, you're my favorite five-year-old in the whole wide world. And they think, I'm the favorite five-year-old. Now, I've got a granddaughter now who's 16, driving and everything. And I'll tell them, I'll say, uh, <clears throat> your papa's girl, you know, and si uh, Sydney, my oldest, will say, I was the first. I was the first. She doesn't mind the others being papa's girl or papa's boy, too, but she says, I was the first. So what do they know? They know that I love them. So what do I know? I know that he loves me from before the foundation of the world. I know that I'm a son who brings joy to the Father. Think about that. You are a son or a daughter, not who does right, but who brings joy to the Father. You think about that. You know what God expects from you? Nothing. That's exactly right. God expects nothing from you except that you're His. I, I read, and, and they're, they're well-meaning. I was reading something this morning, and, 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 uh, and the author was talking about what God, all God expects from us is for us to be this way toward Him. That's all He expects. He expects nothing from us. Now, we are a certain way to Him because He loves us. But that's not His expectation. His expectation is for Him to love me and to call me dear. 
Well, I am a child loved by his father. I am a son who brings joy to the father. I am a son, a fellow heir, in whom the father is well pleased. That's how he looks at me, and that's how he looks at you. He looks at you as someone that he is well pleased. Well, I am one in Christ. I am co-seated in Him on His throne. I used to say with Him, and that could be translated that way. But it also grammatically is, is totally correct to translate it in. So I am seated not just with Christ, not beside Christ with a long list of others, but I am seated in Christ on His throne. Colossians 3, 4. This may be my favorite at all of all. Colossians 3, 4. It says that I am revealed in heaven to the angels and other saints in His glory. When Christ, who is my life, is revealed, so will I be also. I am revealed to the angels. He's my life. At the same time, He is. Now, this is a really, really big deal. Let me tell you something else. Do you know the angels understand more at this point about you than you do about you? They know how special you are. Now, I can just see the angels looking over the edge of heaven, looking down at you, thinking, Wow, she's exactly what you said she was, Father. Or, He's exactly what you said. Well, I am this and I'm so much more and it will, it will take all of eternity for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to reveal just what the gift of His life given to me means. It is so much bigger than I think any of us can imagine on this side. Well, we're going we're gonna to go back up in, the script, up in the verses here and we're going to just read. We're not going to hone in on the first verses, but we're going to look at them. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. This word love, this is a word that would be the mother's love or the father's love. If I talk and even share truth and it's not, if, if it's not coming out of love, then it's just noise. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all my, and know all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Now this is true, but it's also a metaphor. He said, if I could do all of these things, but I didn't have love, nothing. Verse 3, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Nothing. Well, let me say this. Love is a person. Love is not a thing. Love is a person. So I'm going to tell you something. You do have love. And so my, my thinking for you and for me is that we walk in the love that we have. We walk in Christ. And then in the next few verses, it gives us a picture of what love is. And this is exciting. And by the way, this would be fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. Love is patient. You know, that's who you are in Christ. Love is kind. I had a friend. I have a friend. And a uh, <clears throat> very kind man. And he's, he's a man's man, this guy is. Uh, his name is Don. Don, if you're watching, I'm talking about you. I even wrote about you in the book, in a book. And uh, Don's such a great guy. He's a super talented guy. He's been a music evangelist most of his life and, and uh, just an amazing guy got a lot of kids and even more grandchildren just an amazing guy and uh, one day I said Don you sure are kind and uh, I think he said to me he says well Craig I think that no he calls me brother Craig well brother Craig I, I think that you ought to be kind don't you and I thought yeah I do and you're a good picture but when I think of what kindness looks like, your face comes to my mind. You're a very kind man. Well, that's just Jesus being kind through him because love is kind. Love is not jealous. I can remember the time going back to Brother Don again. I've had some folks that had these guys with some other people in my church many times. 
and uh, speaking and preaching and, and doing music and just they're so gifted, so talented. But we wanted to do something one night, I remember, and, and people come and they would hear these guys and they they had tapes and, and later on CDs and people would come because they're so talented. And I remember one night we were going to do something on evangelism and he said, well, Brother Craig, I think you ought to do that because you're just more gifted at that than we are. Now you think, what is the... Why would he say something like that? Because he believed that. And there's no jealousy in love. He said, there's no credit here to be had. They're not coming to see us. They're coming. They're coming because we want them to know about this love. There's no jealousy in love. Love does not brag and love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if, the, if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Well, anything wrong with any of these things I just listed? No, nothing wrong with any of them. Why will they be done away with? Because we won't need prophecy when we're face to face. We'll know. We'll not only know, but we'll know as we're known. We'll see as we're seen. We'll look at things through the eyes of grace, totally grace as a person. So when you read these things, here's how a lot of people read this stuff. Now, this is what love is. Now, you need to go and do these things. You need to change this. You need to stop that. You need to stop acting unbecomingly. You need to stop remembering a wrong suffered. You need to, to start rejoicing with truth. You need to bear all things, and you need to believe all things, and you need to endure all things. You need to be perfect. You could preach this, and you could just really hammer on people. In fact, it's been done. Well, that's not what this is about. These are statements of fact. This is who, not what, this is who love is. Who are we talking about right here? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Son of God, the, the God-man. Now, the God-man said, it's good that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send a comforter. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't just show up on the scene. He's always been, because He's fully God, and He's every place at one time, at all times. He's not bound by time or space. But the Holy Spirit, He didn't just show up in your life either, but now He has empowered you to live as who you are. This is who you are. So here's the problem. You try to do these things, you fail. And then the enemy will have you feel bad about it. And he'll have you believe that there's no hope. And he'll tell you, yeah, you call yourself a Christian. Look at there. You're arrogant. You brag. You're jealous. You're not patient. You're not kind. You seek your own. You're provoked easily. You take into account a wrong suffered. And you don't rejoice all the time with, uh, with you don't rejoice with righteousness or, and you don't always rejoice in the truth. You just throw these things at you. That's not you. That's a lie. It is you. It's the same lie that Satan told in the garden to Eve. You know the reason God doesn't want you to eat from this tree? The reason that He doesn't want you to eat from this tree because He knows the day you eat from this tree, you're going to be just like Him. And what was the lie? They were already like Him. They were created in His image. Another lie was, and you're going to know right from wrong. God never intended for you to know right from wrong. You say, what? No. He intended for you to walk in Him. He didn't list this stuff right here so you could do them. He listed this stuff so that He would know, so that you would know who you are. This is the true you as you walk in who you are. Now He's going to show you who you are. The reason that, that people struggle with these things is because they don't believe it's true. They don't believe that this is truly them. It is truly them because you're in Christ and Christ is in you and this is Jesus. 
You can put her name with every one of these things. His name is Jesus. Okay. Love never fails. Verse 10. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. He says in verse 9, For now we know in part and prophesy in part. He says when the perfect comes. I'm going to tell you something. The perfect has come. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. He has come. And He didn't come and leave and just leave you say, okay, now do the best you can. He didn't do that. He didn't say, now give it your best effort. He didn't do that. That's what they say in churches, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, there's going to be somebody that I'm going to leave with you. And He's going to be more than with you. He's going to be in you. And He'll live this life through you. And it's the Holy Spirit. Equal with God the Father and God the Son and yet has a different role. Verse 11. When I was a child, here's the problem. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. And now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. Okay, verse 11. When I was a child, spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child, became a man, did away with childish things, speak like a child. A child is only interested in what he wants and in what he thinks is his. That's a child. A child will do whatever he has to do to get his own way. And I'm sorry, but this has been me a lot of the time. If you're with the child, listen to who children talk about. And we've all been guilty of this to some degree. Think like a child, act like a child. A child's speech is centered around himself. Think like a child. A child understands from his perspective. You know, when you're dealing with a child, what's your goal? Your goal is to have a child think differently. The Bible says, so a man thinks, so is he. And this is how people are today. A child thinks that everyone thinks like him. Think about that. A child thinks that everyone thinks like him. This is a problem with the news media. News media, this little group of people, and it's not just news media, it's, it's a lot of folks, but they think that everybody thinks like them. I've known people... I've had people say to me, Craig, what's wrong with you? You don't think like I do. And she didn't say that, but thought it. What's wrong? You don't think like I do. We all think that. What's wrong with him? He doesn't think like I do. That is the way a child thinks. A child thinks that they have to do something to get their way. That's how a child thinks. A child does not understand that he has a loving father who only wants what is best for him. Doesn't seem loving when he's not giving me what I think I want. You say, well, <laughs> who is this? That's been all of us. This is me. This is you times. But here's the good news. That's not who you really are. That is not who you are. You may think, well, he's talking about me. He's talking to me. He's preaching at me. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you. That's how a child thinks. Can you go back and forth? Can you, can you think like a child one moment and then another moment you really begin to understand? Of course you can. It's called flesh. It's called flesh. Flesh is not who you are. You can walk according to the flesh, but you're walking it and living out of a lie because that is not who you are. Well, it is the Father's job. Listen to this. This is good news. It is the father's job to reveal this to the child and not the child's job to discover it for himself. Do you hear I said that? It's the father's job to reveal this issue to the child. And the child is not going to figure this out on his own. Praise the Lord. Our loving father will reveal his love and his loving nature to his children. Now, it's not the Father's desire to change you. He's already done that in eternity. It is the Father's desire for you to know what He's done for you. 
for you to know His unconditional love for you. It's amazing, going back to my children and grandchildren. They may not know a lot, but they know I love them. Who's that? That's my papa. He'll say crazy things. He'll do stupid stuff. What do you really like about him? He loves me. Well, God the Father doesn't do stupid stuff and He doesn't say crazy things, but He loves me. So when you know that God the Father loves you, it really it changes the way you look at other people. It's for us. It is the job of the child, ready, to receive the love that the Father gives. That is the only job of the child is to receive this love that has already been given. If he doesn't receive it, which some children don't, you've seen it. Are they still loved? Do they feel loved? No. Are their lives fun? No, they're not fun at all. Because they're always kicking at the goads, as the Holy Spirit told Paul. Why are you kicking at the goads? As a child receives this love and begins to believe that it's his, his thinking changes and he begins to think like the Father. You know what we call that? We call that maturing. We call that maturing not only in the physical sense on this earth, but we call that maturing in Christ. As we begin to receive, we can give what we have received. One of the reasons people struggle loving is because they don't really believe their love. For whatever reason, when people begin to understand that they are totally loved, completely loved, it changes actions. But tragically, we try to change actions first, hoping that it will lead to something, but it doesn't. We're going to look at reasoning like a child, reason like a child. Well, uh, We need to consider, count, reckon, compute, reason. A child only reasons or considers things or circumstances from his perspective, not from the perspective of others. You know, in the computer lingo, computer jargon, we say this, garbage in, garbage out. Computers only can deal with what you put in there. And if you put right information in, it'll give right information out. If you put bad information in, it doesn't fix anything. It's, it's, it just gives bad information back. Well, it's the same way. If you have a fallacy or false understanding of who Christ is and the fact that He loves you, then you'll never understand this. So we need to start from this. First of all, there is a God. And His nature is to love and He loves you. The Father is the one who teaches a child to count the cost, to put others before himself. How does he do that with you? By loving you. This is done by our earthly father and, and by our heavenly father, and only the father can do this. Now, what if people on this earth don't have a father? Many, 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 many people are born on this earth without the love of a physical, earthly father. Well, I, this is what I tell people. Over the years, ministering to a lot of young men, you say, why young men? Because that's per predominantly what I was ministering to. And, and these young men, you know what they desire? These tough guys, athletes, you know what they desire? They desire the love of a father. I think that's one of the reasons they were drawn to me. They desire the love of a father. And this is what I tell them. I can say to them, Fred, Jimmy, John, Frank, whatever. You can be the kind of father you always want it to be. You can be the kind of father you always wanted. There's a young man, I'll say his name. His name is Eric. Eric was raised by his grandmother. Father wasn't around, never was around. His mother pretty much abandoned him too and he was raised by his grandmother. And Eric believed that, that he could be the kind of father that he always wanted. And Eric has done that. Eric trusted Christ as a, a young teenager and a superior athlete, just a really fine, high character young man. And uh, his children are amazing. Eric has got a wife. Eric has got three children. And he's really proud of his children. And he's there for his children. And he's the kind of father he always wanted. You know why? Because he knows he has a father. The father that he knows is God the Father. And it's changed the way that Eric lives his life. 
there's still a Heavenly Father and He loves you and He will reveal His way of reasoning to you through anyone He chooses or through no one except the Spirit if He chooses. Going back to Eric one time, he was working at a hospital. It's really funny. Nothing funny, just I'll just share the story. He was working on the weekend at a hospital and they would work two 12-hour days, you know. And, and this guy came into the hospital and he was, he was demonic, pure and simple. And scared the people in the hospital to death. I think he was in the emergency room. I mean, he was, he was just nutso. And Eric went up to him and he said, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, any demon spirit in this man come out now and I tell you to stop now. And the man just was auto automatically just calm. And the people in the hospital thought, Who is this guy that's on the mop? I mean, who is this guy that's empty in the trash? They didn't know what to do. They're educated. The doctors didn't know. The nurses didn't know. The administrators didn't know. But the guy put his mop down and dealt with it because he knew there was a father and he loved him. I think that's a pretty cool story, don't you? I think it's a really cool story. Well, it's still through the father, however the father reveals to you His love. It's going to be the Father. He can do it through a man. He can do it through a program. He can do it just through the Spirit speaking to Him in the still, small voice. When I became a man, I did away with childish things, Paul said. And Paul was speaking metaphorically. When the unfamiliar is expressed in terms of the familiar, that's what we call metaphor. Things that I do know about explaining things that I don't know about. There's another person who did that. Who was it? Jesus taught with stories all the time. Well, a grown man can be a child spiritually. And when one matures in Christ, he grows up spiritually. See, this is not an age thing. It's not an age thing. Well, how does one mature in Christ? It's not by doing more. It's not by doing more for Jesus or even for people. It's not by loving Jesus more. It's not by obeying more. It's not by praying more. It's not by giving more. It's none of those things. It's not by reading your Bible more. Some people think that God speaks to them through their Bible, and of course He does. But God speaks to you in many ways. So how does one mature grow up in Christ? Answer. Going back to verse 12. Let's read verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. And that's how we see now. But then, face to face, and that's not just when you die. I used to think this was when you die. It's not when you die. It's for now. This is for now. For now I know in part. But then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. I will know love completely. Knowing as I am known. Seeing in a mirror clearly and not dimly. And does this happen when you die? The answer would be, of course it does. It does happen when you die. But it's not like what you think. Do you have to die to do this? Okay. Yeah. You do have to die. But it's in a different kind of thing. It happens as we begin to know that when Christ died, we died. And when Christ was buried, we were buried. And when Christ was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life. The old you, the old me, was buried from eternity past. And the new me was raised to walk in, a, in this new life, and it's His life. Now, this is for all people, but all people don't know it. People freak out when I say, now this is for everybody. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, when one died, all died. It's in there. And if you read that, the rest of that chapter from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 21, you'll see that's what he meant by that. This is for everyone. But they don't know it and they don't walk in it. They've not received it. They've not believed it. But it's still done. Well, I began to walk in His love and acceptance for me when I know it. 
Now, whose job is it to reveal it to me? It's His job. As I know this, I can love and accept others even when they don't deserve my love and acceptance. Now, this is just like the Father. It is who He has made you to be. Think of your old children again or your own grandchildren. Have there been times that they did not, quote unquote, deserve your love? They were disobedient. They were rebellious. They were just downright mean. But did you still love? Of course you did. But this involves brokenness. Remember when I was talking about the basic training unit, I said they were broken? When we used to travel around, I was in a music group, and uh, we used to travel all over the country. And I was on staff of Campus Crusade for Christ, and, and we did, I was in more than one group, and one of the groups was more of a rock kind of group, and I enjoyed that, but it wasn't my favorite. My favorite was the bluegrass theme, and we used to travel around, and I found that bluegrass would go no matter where we went. If we were in a college, they thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever heard. If you were in a prison, they thought it was great. If you were in a church, they thought, hey, this stuff's great. And I remember going to military bases, and I love going to military bases, and we did some real big deals there. But if we would go there, I'd always say this, no matter what you have planned for us, I want to be in the basic training places, the basic training units. And the reason I wanted to be there, because they were ready to hear that there's a God and He loves them. They were broken. Brokenness is the key. But brokenness is not your job. Our only job is to believe that it's Him and receive all that He's given us in Him and trust Him totally. Now you can't do any of that in your own power. You depend on Him for all of these things. It's all Him. Always was, always will be. All Him. But this leads to knowing His victory and His peace, knowing Jesus. And Jesus is the answer. Jesus equals love. Jesus equals peace. Jesus equals everything. Jesus is grace. His name is Jesus. Know as you're known and you'll begin to... This is going to sound strange treat other people like they're known. You see somebody, and, and according to the flesh, I am as bad as anybody. I just want to smack them in the mouth sometimes. I'm just glad God didn't think like me. Aren't you? Well, I hope this has been a benefit to you. It certainly has me. As I was reading this week, I knew I was supposed to share here, and I just pray that it was a blessing to you. We'll see you next time.